And we ought to begin by clarifying that from the outset, this was intended to be a physical conference. The recent pandemic obviously has led us to turn it into a virtual event. And during a time of enforced distance and mass protests for social justice, it seems important to carve out some space, even if virtually, for collective reflection on the commons. By commons, we refer not only to the natural environment and its resources, but also to shared social creations that result from human labor, such as public spaces, information, culture, ideas, new technologies, and cyberspace. Importantly, we envisage commoning as an ongoing collective practice and ethos that does not merely concern an end, but also a means, a process. This virtual conference will inquire into the relevance of the commons in an age of digital transformation, mounting inequalities, institutional violence, and global pandemic. We ask whether this new reality can become the basis for new practices of commoning, from the socialization of goods, healthcare, digital content, to radical forms of reciprocity, collective care, and community solidarity. With that, now I'm going to hand over to Mikhail, who will moderate the panel. Hi, everyone. Uh, so I'm really excited to present our second panel for the day, entitled Whose Commons for Whom, which inquires into new methodologies for mapping, understanding, and defining the commons as a contested and dynamic domain. Taking into consideration people on the move due to conflict, migration, and gentrification, on the one hand, and the proliferation of cyber and virtual places on the other, it seeks to address new points of entry into the commons. This panel asks, how might we renegotiate power dynamics around the production, distribution, and representation of knowledge and narratives to reclaim the commons physically and digitally? How does activism fit into these issues, especially during these in light of recent events? So to address all these questions and many more fascinating questions, we are honored to have with us today leading voices in academia, media and digital theory, urban planning, geography, and activism. We have invited guests from a variety of disciplines to offer their insight into whether the politics of solidarity and cooperation can bring out systematic change. So I will now be presenting each one of our speakers. And after that, I will invite them to begin their presentation in an alphabetic order. And please uh, both excuse and correct any mispronunciations on my behalf. Um, so first of all, we have Tali Khutka. She, uh, she is an architect, urban planner, and associate professor at Tel Aviv University. She had and founded the International Laboratory of Contemporary Urban Planning and Design that investigates connection between the built environment and sociocultural dynamics. Her recent book, The Design of Protest, focuses on forms of civil participation worldwide and was exhibited at the MIT Museum. Her new research project, Descent, Public Spaces and Immigration, is founded by the German-Israeli Foundation for Scientific Research and Development. Dizzy Papaharasi, is a professor of political science and head of the communication department at the University of Illinois, Chicago, and a university scholar at the University of Illinois system. Her work focuses on the social and political consequences of online media. She is the founder and the current editor of the open access journal, Social Media and Society. Her books include, amongst many others, Trump and Media, Effective Public, Sentiment, Technology and Politics, and her next book, After Democracy, is forthcoming in late 2020. Next up, we have Doina Petrescu, uh, who's an activist, architect, researcher, and educator, dealing with common-based resilience, feminist approaches, and participative architecture. A founding member of the Paris-based Atelier de Architecture Autogerie, she is a professor of architecture and design activism at the University of Sheffield. Her recent publication include The Social Reproduction of Architecture, Learn to Act, Architecture and Resilience, and the forthcoming book, Architecture, Other How, Practicing for a Future, which is not what it used to be. And finally, we have Lara Lopresti, who is a postdoctoral research at the University of Padua, an affiliation member of the International Research Project, Mapping and the Making of the Empire. 
at the University of Groningen. Her recent research focuses on the cultural and effective ecologies and the technological and political digitalities that allow maps and mapping to elicit and embody a variety of discourses, actions, and feeling about the European migration crisis, as well as about alternative imagine, Im imaginings of solidarity and hostility. Um, and now I would like to invite Tali to kick things off. Thank you very much. Uh, let me just... Okay, so thank you for the introduction. Do you hear me? Yeah? Okay, great. So thank you for the introduction and the invitation. I'm really glad to participate in this timely event. Um, I will try to address the comments from the perspective of uh, distances, a timely category that I have been working on for a while. And I will try to discuss briefly the idea of geometries of distances and the role of commons in all of this. So I will start with this. Distances are everywhere, among family and friends, in the way we communicate, in the way we share our thoughts and ideas, in the way we move in the city, and in the way we inhabit our living spaces and even in the way we perceive our past, present, and future. Distances are everywhere and they are enhanced in our, in our times of ICTs. Our perception of distance is both negative and positive. It is both definite and reflective. It is multi-layered and fundamental category in understanding our daily lives. To be sure, we nurture distances. They help us feel safe and confident. They create a place where we can hide secrets. Distances are also maintained through daily practices uh, driven by cultural norms and political institutions that advance regulations that differentiate between the private and the public. Clearly, these regulations serve as a means to establish hierarchies among people and between citizens and the government. When needed, the government guarantees distance by modifying or tightening uh, regulations and ensuring that boundaries are understood and maintained. Through this ongoing process of maintaining and defining distances, social order is achieved, aggression is suppressed, and an illusion of stability is attained. Distance has always been a key category in understanding social dynamics, and even more so these days. Although it is common to address distance from spatial perspectives, it carries multiple meanings. Socially, the term distance refers to the increased social space between different individuals, which allows for greater disembedding of social interactions. Social distance is based on social norms that differentiate individuals and groups based on race, ethnicity, age, sex, social class, religion, and nationality. The greater the social distance between individuals and groups, the less they influence each other. This approach of enhancing social distance as a means to reduce influence was also used during the uh, COVID-19 pandemic. The imposed social distance by governments has both economic and political meanings. The process of distanciation in modern society has dramatically changed economic thinking towards a logic that is blind to qualitative differences and only cares about quantitative dimensions such as profits. The effect is a weakening of social bonds and increased individuality. And in, in extreme cases, isolations. Individuality as opposed to community or social groups is easy to manage and control. Each person is viewed as a defined unit. The conceptualization of social distance is also political. The idea of distance is also important in understanding citizens' distance from the state. In that respect, it is not surprising that China was the first state to impose the contested lockdown on its citizens, a measure that was perceived at first as an extreme violation of liberal values, 
However, many other liberal democracies have followed this approach, violating various rights, including privacy. Above all, the concept of distance affects not only how we communicate with and approach others or those in power, but also how we think about an event or an idea which has an impact on whether we view it in abstract or concrete terms. If a person is in a closer pro proximity to people, places, or events, he or she will likely to think more concretely and focus on the present in great detail. In the case of the pandemic, much of the data information were abstract, illustrated by numbers and maps. The result enhanced distances at all levels. I think that we focus too much on social distances, but distances were taking place at all levels and spheres, increase individual isolation while also creating an abstract narrative of the event as a whole. Distances associated with the use of, of the public space are not unique to the pandemic. Planners and architects play a key role in demarcating distance by defining the geometry of space, a geometry that is not only a high signature of lifestyle and capital needs, but also a signature of power. The built environment frames everyday life by offering certain spaces for programmed actions while closing off other possibilities. The main place we can challenge distances are in the commons. The commons are the place where we challenge isolation and create new partnerships, mainly through protest. In everyday life, we avoid behaviors and boundaries that we believe will be met with force. However, during protests, these public facilities provide a physical reference for negotiation over competing or hidden messages and symbols. As such, the meanings and the manifestation of political distance in places emerge from the meaning that people assign or read into them rather than their actual physicality. So what I'm trying to, see, to say here is that this human motivation to challenge current practices of distance is actually critical uh, in the process of enacting and designing protests and actions in the commons. So what I suggest here is a threefold argument. First, government and authorities use distance as a tool to create order and hierarchy. Distance is marked in the planned physical space and maintained by us, by daily practices, regulation, and influence how we communicate. And third, I believe that protests, civil actions are the tools through which we can actually challenge uh, these agreed upon uh, distances. To be sure, the task of challenging agreed upon practices of distance is not trivial. The imposition of distance as dictated by political ideology in public spaces through the definition of social rules and boundaries is intensifying. The protests triggered by the, uh, the coronavirus uh, outbreak in Berlin, US, Israel, and elsewhere is just the first wave of events. These events mark a sea change from the blind obedience of citizens to increased expressions of anger, fear, and anxiety. Civil obedience as seen during the coronavirus virus, uh, pandemic is temporary and related to the fear from the unknown. To date, science did not provide answers regarding the pandemic, which raised many concerns among the public. Many politicians worldwide took advantage of this panic and even intensified it. The explanations given to citizens were partial and often by a small group of experts. Citizens listened and obeyed, even at the cost of their livelihood and personal life. For the citizen in the secular modern age, science, modern medicine, and the state, are all powerful institutions that can solve all miseries. However, as shown by the recent crisis, this is not the case. Stunned and alarmed, the crowd shut down in their homes, hoping for any piece of information. So the question is again, what are the means by which people can challenge social distances? What I suggest is two very basic uh, tools. So first, human imagination, the tool by which people consider themselves part of a larger whole, and they refuse to retreat to the isolation of the private sphere. To counter react discrepancies, imagination may be the only tool at their disposal. And secondly, the commons as the social platform that challenge bounded politics by using imagination and space to create new possibilities. In essence, this platform, the commons, 
advances discursive change is based on a flexible strategy that tolerates various forms of actions and conflicted positions that allows activists to modify its character based on what is actually happening on the ground. So as history has taught us, distances, whether legal, social, or cultural, are elastic. And this is very important because the same is true for our time. Protests revolve around multiple issues, democracy. So each context, in each context, we see different types of protests with different goals, democracy, race, freedom, economics, and hope. Due to the rules of social remoteness and the need to maintain two meters of distance from one another, protests have crafted aesthetic performances. In this sense, contemporary protests are a form of repair that reconnects citizens after lengthy social remoteness and distances. And I just want to give a few examples of how uh, social distances nowadays have influenced some of the uh, social uh, the protest choreographies. Uh, and one of them is of course body. Uh, so for example, in challenging social distances, the key tool of course is the body. Current regulation produce creative form of protest ones that have not been seen before. And what we see here are protests for democracy by the black flag movements in uh, Jerusalem. And you can see how they maintain and keep the distances. Um, again, something, another dimension that was influenced by the regulation regarding social uh, distances or the way space is being used. And space of course is very important and it's the main decision uh, activists are doing regarding their choreography of protest. And what we see here is a Tel Aviv municipality, municipality uh, place stickers that marks the distances, suppose the, the distances between uh, activists during protests, and this is the way it looks during the events in Tel Aviv. And lastly, and again, another uh, example of the teachers, but I think that lastly, what is really uh, becoming common, not just in Israel, but everywhere, is the issue of tactic and how, uh, due to the challenges of social distances, um, activists are trying to find new ways to express their grievances. Uh, so we see many uh, events that have actually no scale. Some of them are massive, some of them are actually with no uh, participants at all. And this is, for example, um, the demonstration by the artists uh, in Tel Aviv, again, in light of the economic uh, crisis. And I think that what's important to take from all these events, the recent events that try or aim to challenge uh, social, economic, and political distance is to reflect about their meaning and specifically criticize, uh, critically think about their uh, aesthetic dimension. Because at the end of the day, um, to be sure this, this uh, distanciation nurture aesthetic pro protest. However, a protest that seeks to bring about change cannot remain within the boundaries of aesthetic. It must have an address to whom it is directed and to whom to deliberate a message and a body on behalf of the protesters that can be debated. Um, to be sure, um, so this is what uh, I wanted to say before, but in an age uh, characterized by blurred boundaries between people, places, and spaces, further scrutiny of the dynamic notion of distance might be helpful. Distance has enormous impact on how social power is manifested in space and even more so during protests. For me, what's important is to emphasize is that the concept of distance is critical in addressing contemporary protests and carries multiple meanings, uh, perceptual, political, social, and spatial meanings. Perceptual distance is a means to understand reality and how we think about events and places concrete or abstract. And this, uh, the perceptual is very important uh, if we want to understand uh, a phenomena or even the pandemic as a whole. Political distance is also a very important category because it is relating to the condition of disagreeing with, dissenting from and disputing those in power. During protest, activists claim power and pre-motivated to hit the streets and challenge the practices of the powerful. 
Social distance, I have already mentioned, refers to the individual position, high or low, with respect to others. And during protests, again, this is the opportunity to challenge some of these distances. And lastly, of course, spatial distances, which, is, which has become a, a focal point during uh, the last few months due to the pandemic. But what's important is uh, to say is that the 21st century is an age of active city, uh, civic participation. And we are at the beginning of civil sovereign negotiations over social, political, and economic distances. Negotiations are contested because at the end of the day, distances are desired and practiced by all of us. So the key, key questions for me, and I think that also should be for, for other uh, scholars, is that is distance a universal category or contextual? What is the influence uh, of the crisis on the conceptions and practices of distances? How distances are manifested in public space in varied contexts? What are the methods we can use to analyze the geometries of distances? And what are the complementary tools available to us beyond social movements? And this is, again, I refer to the previous session to negotiate distances. And again, as I started, I just want to uh, finish with uh, a few notes. Distances are everywhere. The pandemic shed light on it. However, they are there and will continue to be there. And they will continue to be in public spaces and they will continue to, we will continue to see them in the commons. We need to acknowledge them and constantly negotiate them in the commons. The commons are manifestations of our distances. We have to be aware of the distances we create and maintain in the commons during times of routines and not just during times of crisis. What we left with is the commons as a social platform to negotiate, debate, bargain the distances we created. Thank you. Thank you, Tali. And now I invite um, Zizi to please uh, begin our presentation. Thank you, it's a pleasure to be here. Just give me a second to get the screen share set up. Okay, so I don't, are you able to see my screen yet or no? And not just yet. Okay, one. I think we're good, right? Yes, we can see it now. Okay, all right. Um, oh, thank you. Uh, uh, good evening, I guess. It's such a, again, as I mentioned, it's such a pleasure to be part here of a uh, an all-female panel uh, with such interesting thinkers, scholars. I, uh, uh, Tali, I really enjoyed your presentation. I think there's so much, I think you'll find there's so much commonality be between what you just said and what I'll be saying. And I got a preview of uh, what some of you will be talking about. And I'm just uh, uh, really excited to have a conversation uh, with all of you and with our audience um, post-presentation. So, um, most of my work focuses on the social and political consequences of the net and the many platforms that it supports. Uh, lately, I've taken an interest, uh, not lately, I think for some time now, for the past 10 years now, I've been interested in um, soft structures of feeling and civic engagement, the commons. So this is what I would like to focus on today through going over some research that we've been uh, conducting with my colleagues at the University of Illinois in Chicago. So with my colleagues, we've been tracking sentiment expression online, mostly on Twitter, um, starting with uh, the um, uprisings in Egypt that led to the uh, resignation of Hosni Mubarak nearly 10 years ago, and then moving on to the Occupy movement, uh, then also looking at um, generally oriented trending hashtags, Black Lives Matter movement, uh, some aspects of the MAGA movement, uh, the Me Too movement, and so on. So there's not enough time, obviously, to talk about all of this today. But I would like to talk about um, 
I'd like to offer some general conclusions that we've reached. Um, talk about two concepts that we developed in the process, affective news and affective publics, and um, draw connections uh, between those two concepts and the contemporary moment of COVID-19, but also the even more contemporary moment of um, several movements associated with themes of social injustice, including uh, the defund the police movement. Uh, first, some things that um, underpin our understanding of technology, our theoretical premise. So the um, internet is not a magical space. It cannot create something out of nothing. Um, it cannot sem create something that doesn't exist. It doesn't create democracy all on its own. It doesn't destroy democracy all on its own. Um, also, the internet pluralizes, but doesn't necessarily democratize. It um, opens up paths to connection. Uh, those paths do not lead to democracy always. It connects democratically oriented people and also connect fascists. Um, nor does it amplify voice on equal terms. And I think this is where issues of privatization that pertain to our panel come in. It amplifies, but it doesn't equalize. Um, it doesn't extinguish social problems either. It does not create hate speech. It's not responsible for it, but it certainly makes it more visible and makes toxicity more easily spreadable. Um, now, some things about our approach, we were mostly interested in storytelling functions, new storytelling functions of Twitter and other media that Twitter serves as a conduit to. We were not looking for affect. Uh, which you will notice pops up a lot in the terminology and the theoretical vocabulary that we developed. We just kind of sort of stumbled on it as the most convincing explanation for the phenomena we were encountering. Um, I want to briefly explain what affect is that as it connects to these concepts, but also some of the um, civic articulations uh, that we are uh, all studying and uh, investigating and observing <laughs> and engaging in in a variety of spaces, uh, commons, online and offline or hybrid versions of commons. So um, drawing from literature from the fields of political science, philosophy and psychology, we understand affect as a sentiment, mood, a sense of a feeling is not an emotion, but it is the intensity with which we feel. Uh, so for example, if you if a song that you like starts playing and you tap your foot to it, that is an affective reaction. If someone, uh, if you're in conversation with someone and you nod along, not to indicate agreement, that's something else, but just to indicate that you're following in the conversation, um, that is an affective reaction. An example that I really like to use is the, this is the difference between a caress to the face versus a slap. So again, that's the same. Uh, I just got a message that my connection is unstable. So just checking in that everybody can still hear me. N yes, nodding. <laughs> that is an effective reaction. Good. Thumbs up. You sound, you sound great. <laughs> it sounds good. It's, it sounds good. Thank you. Um, and so, uh, you know, a slap to the face uh, versus a caress, it's the same gesture, but applied with a different intensity uh, and can thus reveal a completely different intention and also lead to very different consequences. In very social media platforms, you know, effective reactions include a like, so that indicates that you saw something or signals that you, um, saw something to other publics. It doesn't necessarily communicate that you enjoyed it or the level of that enjoyment. A retweet or a heart similarly indicates a desire to amplify something, to make it more visible, but not necessarily in an endorsement of that point of view. Often it communicates the very opposite. Um, in response to social movements emerging, we wanted to understand how Twitter functioned as a medium for news storytelling and how stories were framed, how events turned into stories. Um, and I want to pause and talk a little bit about that process because we're very interested in the process of events or of how an event might turn into a story or multiple stories that are told about uh, that event. So using John Hartley's definition of news values as the things that turn events into stories, um, we focused on that and we were also further inspired by 
Richard Grusin's understanding of premediation. So Grusin understands premediation as the form that events take on before they turn into stories. And he um, explained uh, that premediation sort of dominated the news infoscape post 9-11. It's very rich in affect. And um, he uh, pointed to the new scroller, scro scroller that emerged at that time and became a permanent fixture of news storytelling since then as an example of premediation and also our obsession uh, with instantaneity and a culture of instantaneity that is constantly reinforced and reproduced in um, new storytelling. Conducted a variety of uh, big data analysis, but we also drew smaller samples that we uh, conducted deep data analysis, qualitative analysis on to uh, ask and understand, you know, whether these platforms, these hybrid commons, make or break movements, revolutions, elections, democracies. Uh, the first the first sort of uh, we were led to the formation of the of two concepts and the first one that I want to talk about is um, this idea of affective news. Uh, it has to do with the shape news takes on as it is broadcast to the rest of the world via social media. Although these tendencies are not new to social media, they can certainly be traced to um, to uh, to legacy media and to the pre-social media era. So. Information curation online often um, takes the form of effective news. Um, the rhythm and the pace of storytelling is instant, it's emotive, it's phatic. Repetition, often in the form of retweeting or endorsing uh, or upvoting, uh, and intensity set the pace of new storytelling. And oral and print um, uh, cultures of storytelling combined. So we see a very interesting reconciliation, blending of the interpersonal traditions of conversation with the broadcasting conventions of news storytelling. Uh, what does effective news look like? Well, I mean, turn on your TVs or turn on your news stream screens. You look at it all the time. It's news, fact, drama, opinion, and mood all blended into one to the point where it's very difficult to tell one from the other and doing so kind of sort of misses um, misses the point. Um, there's a flattening of news, a loss of substance, a loss of contents, a loss of significance, no sense of the so what question, why are we covering something, what is the relevance of that, relevance of that. Um, so for example, we hear a lot about Hillary Clinton's emails uh, that becomes a headline that is effectively repeated, but we never get to understand exactly what was the problem with those. Uh, we hear chants of defund the police and arguments against that and what it might mean, but we never hear an analysis of exactly what this particular claim, uh, which I understand as an open signifier, um, entails. A um, couple of words on affect and news storytelling and affect and mobilization. So affect or an affective reaction is not news. It's a reaction to news and it's a layer to a news story. It's a way for citizens to feel their way, to sense their way, to understand what is happening. Things become problematic when we start to understand and report affective reactions as news. And so we have a number of, um, uh, of tweets by presidential figures that are reported uh, constantly and consistently and repetitively with very little analysis. Again, intensifying um, coverage, producing uh, covers that's drummed up to the rhythm of this constant um, obsession with up to the moment uh, uh, cover news coverage, news information dissemination. Uh, the affect in itself can very successfully sustain feelings of community and these can very can reflexively drive publics forward. Um, and we saw that in the case of very of many movements, but they can also entrap them in a state of engaged passivity, sort of a standstill motion. The second concept I want to talk about is um, the idea of affective publics and relate that to COVID-19 and uh, contemporary development. So I understand affective publics as publics that are brought together, identified or disbanded 
through expressions of sentiment. They materialize uniquely and they leave distinct digital footprints. Uh, this may seem like a sort of commonsensical point, but it's one worth emphasizing because all too often we're impressed by the um, social media presence that a certain movement has generated and we expect that all movements will um, articulate, will render the same kind of social media presence. So that's not the case. Every movement is unique and every movement has its own distinct digital imprint. Uh, these public support connective, and here I'm drawing from Bennett and Segerberg's work. So they support connective, not necessarily collective action. There is no overarching collective authority that decides how the story is going to be told, which is why these publics often produce narratives that are fragmented. Um, for example, the narrative produced by Occupy was a, 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 frag, a, a fragmented narrative. And, and, and that was just fine. You know, the point of the Occupy movement was to present people with an opportunity to stand up and be counted, to unite between, again, a common, uh, a common signifier, a common idea. Um, there are some exceptions to this. Uh, there's cases where we see more cohesive, coherent narratives emerge, and that's when curators work very closely with movement leaders to preserve uh, the autonomy of the emerging narrative. So in the early days of the Egypt movement, we saw a lot of on the ground reporting, instant fact checking and work collaboration with information curators that produced a very coherent message, a very coherent frame that presented what was going on as a revolution well before the movement had resulted in regime reversal. We saw something similar with the Me Too movement. There we had very, um, uh, journalists who had done uh, excellent award-winning work um, working together with celebrities uh, to again prevent uh, the movement from being hashtag hijacked for you know and keeping content injections that were disruptive to the movement or were not truthful uh, keeping them away from the narrative uh, about the movement that was emerging online and off. Um, effective publics are powered by effective statements of opinion, fact, or a blend of both. And these in turn produce ambient, always on feeds that further connect and pluralize expression in regimes that are democratic and non. They typically um, produce disruptions, interruptions of dominant political narratives by present presencing underrepresented viewpoints. And they are sustained by streams that are convened around affective commonalities. <clears throat> so the impact of affective publics is symbolic. The agency that's claimed is semantic and the power is of a liminal or an evanescent nature. Um, the impact of affective publics is not gonna be political, economic, sociocultural or instant. Uh, and that's something that's worth emphasizing because all too often we're swayed by the virality with which information moves online. And we assume that change is going to follow in an equally speedy manner. And when that doesn't happen, we're disappointed in ourselves, in our institutions, in our media, um, in our efforts. But it's not just those things that have let us down. It's our own expectations that have misled us because change is gradual. And in the words of Raymond Williams, revolutions are long and they have to be long in order to attain meaning. So to say that something has carry symbolic impact is no small thing. In order to change our institutions, we have to reimagine them first. Now, here's an overview of some of our findings that I already previewed. Uh, for the early days of Egypt, we saw the presence of a collaborative frame that was secured, narrative autonomy that was preserved. For Occupy, we saw a number of content injections that disrupted the movement, hashtag hijacking that sought to, del to delegitimize it. Um, Black Lives Matter, in the early days of that movement, I'm not talking about the current um, resurgence of that movement, we saw many windows of opportunity for change that opened up at peaks of activity. And at those times, hashtag hijacking, again, distracted from the point of the movement. I'm hopeful that another 
uh, window of opportunity is opening up this time around and it will not close up that easily. And then with MAGA, we have a very different movement with a lot of intensity, very little movement, much discord, a lot of bots, the sense that there's a lot of movement, but no direction. No one's really sure where that movement is really headed or what its directionality is. Um, what do social media do? They intensify movements, they connect and divide, they enable acts of um, um, symbolic meaning. Um, how can we relate this to COVID, but also to the wave of protests regarding social injustice that, injustice that developed in our streets, the same streets across which we expressed effectively solidarity around the um, uncertainty we experienced regarding COVID-19. So we now tune in and support around the uncertainty we feel regarding our civic futures and the civic future of communities of color in particular. The news we receive is of an effective nature in anticipation of what might happen with intensity amped up times 100 because we live in circumstances where we truly do not know, but we want to know what will happen. We want to be able to anticipate what we what will happen urgently. Yet the rhythms of effective news reflected in the visual order, the grammar, the syntax, the maps of information, the cartography of the commons do little to soothe our anxiety. They cast us into effective publics and our agency is discursive, our power is liminal, our impact is symbolic. We are caught in this nexus of events that are constructed through accelerated and slow modes of living. Our life is accelerated. We need to plan for the future in a hurry for many contingencies with scenarios, different scenarios with very little information, but our daily living infrastructure is slow. Our living quarters force us to slow down. So slow living yet accelerated, intense, effective news storytelling out of sync completely with our everyday experience. We never really learned to make a slow new structure of storytelling. And I we would argue also never really learned to live with a slow new structure and with slower structures of feeling. We are driven to make sense of everything immediately. And in some ways this, this is making things way worse than they could be. We want to know how COVID will affect us immediately. It's only a natural reaction. We want to have a position on how riots connect or disrupt the logic of protest right away. We hurry to distinguish riots from the logic of the protest. Again, what if we were to understand those riots as a painful yet an essential part of adding to the gravitas of the protest, not as a violent reclaiming of the commons, but as a gesture aimed at showing that there are consequences to police action actions and to the brutality of those uh, police actions. There are consequences to to treating people of color poorly. It is a symbolic, symbolic gesture, a, a very strong one. And it does present a semantic renegotiation of power, of the terms of power, of what the, our institutions are meant to do. That is what defund, defund the police means. Um, I would also add defund politics uh, to that. That's actually one of the core findings of my new book, After Democracy. So in closing, I would like to say that, you know, still we find ourselves in and give ourselves comfort through structures of feeling and solidarity. Um, it is these structures of feeling that compel us to reclaim and reoccupy physical spaces, the physical commons, despite COVID-19 fear and uncertainty, we express solidarity at the dawn of the COVID crisis, we used to say from a social distance, but not without social solidarity. Well, we quickly came up with structures of safety in order to make our structures of feeling visible and presence them out on the streets through protests. So there is solidarity effectively rendered through hybrid commons, but there is also distance, not just physical distance, distance and information alone cannot mend that distance, especially when our primary prevalent forms of news storytelling amplify that distance. Because in the end, 
Our technologies do network us, but it is our stories that connect us, identify us, and also potentially divide us. Thank you very much. Thank you, Zizi. And I will now hand on to Dorina, please, to begin her presentation. Thanks a lot. Um, can you hear me? Can yes, hear me? I can hear you very well, yeah. OK, thanks. You. Uh, well, I'll try to set up my, uh, <clears throat> OK. Um, so I'll drag you in a different context, <laughs> in a <clears throat> in a physical context and in a social housing estate um, um, to ask uh, the questions of the session, whose comments, for whom, uh, but also for what. Uh, I think this is very important. And uh, I'll do this through a practice-based perspective, uh, focusing on urban commons more particularly and addressing also the role of architects and, and designers uh, in answering these questions. <clears throat> so, um, commons, as I will speak about, because there are many definitions that we have heard also uh, this uh, morning or the, uh, late, uh, earlier, uh, it was not really morning. <laughs> um, so, my definition would be that they are form of organization and practice um, through which a community of commoners uh, manage common resources according to collectively agreed rules. Um, and there are different types of commons we see here, uh, you know, a taxonomy uh, proposed by um, Michael Bounds. There are material, immaterial, inherited and produced. And uh, I think that urban commons are including somehow uh, parts of all this uh, and, and they are, somehow in the middle of all this. And, and for this reason, they are, in my uh, opinion, uh, of strategic importance uh, when we are discussing about commons. Uh, and um, I think, uh, you know, they can be seen as a political project uh, because the question of commons is at the heart of the discussion on democracy. Um, again, as we have heard earlier, um, according to, um, you know, Antonio Negri and Hart, the contemporary revolutionary project is uh, directly concerned with how to capture, divert, and appropriate and reclaim the commons that we are producing uh, as a constituent process. Um, we, uh, we heard uh, earlier um, uh, Massimo Di Angeli speaking about, uh, you know, the commons as part of the everyday life. And I think it's very, very important to understand this as an appropriation, but also as a way of uh, um, reinventing how how we see and live things. Um, but also, uh, commons are uh, an important, um, you know, resilience or ecological project uh, because uh, they might offer uh, a potential answer to this huge question: how. Uh, what do we do when, when uh, as a global society, when we consume the resources of two planets and a half? And I think uh, this accelerated overconsumption has many consequences, as we know. Um, you know, climate change being only one of these, and there are so many other related uh, crises and problems. Uh, so, including COVID. Uh, so, learning how to govern our cities and countries and ultimately the planet as a commons uh, is is related to this imperative of learning how to become more resilient and certainly more democratic and this uh, you know uh, process uh, needs actors uh, needs agency uh, and archi architects i think uh, can be uh, amongst uh, these actors that uh, can play a role uh, so uh, I also think that um, we, and I'm speaking now uh, on behalf of Atelier d'Architecture Autogéré, which is a, a collective practice that I'm representing here, um, uh, we set up um, a strategy model called RURBAN in 2008. Uh, and with RURBAN, we um, 
we have somehow put strategically uh, the urban commons at the intersection between the political and the ecological questions. Uh, R stands here, stands, stands here for uh, all ecological R's, um, reduce, reuse, recycle, but also for resilience as a transformative condition, which allows not only uh, to adapt, but also to transform and reinvent our society towards a more Equi uh, equitable and more balanced um, way of living. And uh, the R also st stands for resourcefulness. Uh, and uh, through this, we situate resilience in a positive light, uh, relating it to, to the empowerment and agency of citizens in emerging communities. So we imagine this strategy as an open source framework um, uh, and the commoning process that will enable residents to play an active role um, in changing the city while they are changing their own ways of living in it. And this framework uh, is meant to create a network of citizen, um, the citizen projects and, and, um, and include also grassroots organizations around a series of self-managed collective hubs that are hosting economic uh, and cultural activities uh, as well as everyday life practices that contribute uh, to this idea of um, resilience. And in fact, these hubs are, are forms of urban commons. So the network starts at the neighborhood level, but can progressively expand at the city and even you know, at, at wider levels uh, involving uh, not only residents, but also local authorities, uh, civic and public organization, uh, and other, other stakeholders that can take various uh, responsibilities. So the first First step is uh, creating a physical infrastructure. Um, and this um, is by sizing land opportunities. Sometimes there are only temporary available spaces, derelict buildings, but sometimes also uh, existing spaces that can, uh, can be refurbished on, or changed. Um, and, uh, and it's here that um, through a reversible use, a number of uh, collective hubs can, with, with different um, programs can be installed and, and, and these are places where change can be initiated and can be tested, can be practiced, can be learned. Uh, and these hubs will provide space and resources and training um, and will allow also social and ecological stakeholders to emerge. And also a particularity is that they would function as a network uh, through locally closed circuits and balancing in this way uh, consumption and production, reducing uh, carbon emission and also encouraging in, in a visible way uh, at the level of the neighborhood, the people to uh, live and work more ecologically. Um, so uh, we have started to implement this in 2011. Um, uh, via a partnership with, um, with um, a municipality in a suburban town in the northwest of Paris. And, uh, and we were uh, coordinators uh, in this partnership, which I think in, in terms of power relations was, was very, very important. Uh, and we have planned three hubs. We, we, we got also European funding. Um, and uh, and these hubs were meant to facilitate uh, existing also, but also emerging uh, uh, ecological um, networks and economic networks. So the first one was uh, was in the middle of a, uh, of a social estate um, neighborhood um, where uh, uh, there was uh, a site that belonged to the to the municipality that was uh, uh, available temporary, but for um, like 10 years and we plan to have uh, uh, a hub for civic agriculture pedagogy and ecoculture um, using architecture as a way of showcasing of making visible this discourse that we were speaking about uh, you know using recycled materials uh, passive heating uh, mu multifunctional spaces uh, uh, also uh, spaces for social and economic production and reproduction um, and um, I think this architecture that was also very contested in the neighborhood was meant to showcase uh, what is going on, uh, but also, you know, as part of uh, 
the big problem with, uh, let's say, ecological practices uh, to make visible and tangible uh, all these principles that, uh, you know, people are reading about or are, uh, you know, watching on TV. Um, so, for example, we had um, uh, a series of, uh, we, we call design a series of uh, ecological devices uh, that will, like this one, which is um, um, a phytofiltration uh, device um, for the grey water, uh, but we had uh, also um, a compost heating system, um, again, um, uh, built on site uh, with people, uh, the green walls and drip, drip water irrigation. Um, again, uh, showing directly, you know, this, this, these devices had also a pedagogical dimension, I think. Um, so they have, they were able to see directly um, also the, the benefits of, of changing uh, a lifestyle or, or of, of doing a particular gesture. Um, so we had also smart irrigation uh, device uh, working with specialists and, and researchers uh, in, in order to design them, um, but also showing, uh, you know, the, the benefits of um, reducing, for example, the water consumption. Um, and, and we have done also a quite detailed um, um, explanatory, uh, say, um, uh, research, um, uh, plans or drawings in which we were um, explaining the all these kind of uh, reduced watering techniques uh, uh, planting in a uh, on on um, on on kind of uh, unproductive soil yeah as as we find in in the city um, and um, and this is how it looked like uh, in 2014 uh, the other hub was uh, about recycling uh, and it was installed uh, on on a existing street that was closed and transformed into a parking and again um, I think uh, when we we have chosen the sites that it was because they were available but because they were also sort of paradigmatic of the sites that one can found in in a, um, in, in a social neighborhood um, and again um, uh, we ex experienced with um, uh, reversible um, building, um, uh, having, uh, you know, setting up uh, sp spaces, workshop spaces for recycling and eco-construction, but, but also spaces for designers and um, visitors that um, will work together with, uh, with the community. Um, and then, um, 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 and then this has been taken over by, um, uh, by local stakeholders. Uh, so uh, one very important aspect is the governance aspect, um, because, um, you know, uh, I mean, we know this from uh, Ostrom that, uh, um, you know, in order to, to be resilient, the commons have to, uh, have to, uh, to be based on agreement and on shared concern. And I think to draft uh, this shared concern with people that do not have experience in collective practices was was a challenge, uh, but um, our governance strategy was was based on a multipolar network uh, involving different uh, actors uh, that formed uh, various nuclei that were specialized. There were the compost group, um, the recycling group, um, the kitchen group, and and so on, and. Um, uh, it was uh, interesting to um, uh, to show that um, um, you know building up um, in layers um, the the governance system was um, um, took time and I think uh, it's, it's very very important to um, to not reduce um, you know this uh, uh, this aspect of the commons uh, and and also uh, it's not. Um, uh, it, it is a rich uh, aspect because uh, governments was was in every type of activity was involved in every type of activity. Um, so um, you know, one nice story, for example, is is that of uh, um, one of the stakeholders that came um, as a specialist in work compost and developed little by little a school of compost that has trained others. So. Uh, it's very important. This, these hubs had this very important role of being places of learning, not only 
new practices, but also learning to do things together. I think uh, um, because these these places are 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 absent, and 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 these these people are not activists, so they are um, a sort of um, ordinary um, you know citizen uh, living in. Uh, uh, social housing estates, uh, and, and it's it's important that each of not not all of them, but um, many of them, um, kind of uh, found a space to develop their own uh, interest there. Um, and uh, I, I think uh, the hub uh, became um, like um, a, a very important hub visible and uh, and uh, active uh, in, in the neighborhood um and uh, with lots of consequences in in terms of uh, impact um in terms of uh, creating jobs uh, reducing the um, carbon uh we we have done in a recent um, um uh, article um well uh, that was issued from from a research project a calculation of the value of uh, of of, uh, of the of these commons uh, the value cr created through these commoning activities that, uh, in fact, were not um, only uh, direct financial uh, values, but uh, there were values embedded in uh, um, in the um, um, well in in the uh, increasing of skills in in the um saving of, uh, of 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 the expenses uh, uh from the state but also um you know for the planet there were uh, a lot of uh, uh, savings that uh, if you calculate them uh, um, i think they amounted uh, to uh, one uh, to two millions every year and i think this is very important because uh, in, in terms of uh, community economy return on investment this means uh, 180 percent of the initial uh, investment which is much much higher uh, type of uh, return on investment than a capitalist project and um, uh, and it's, it's, it's very important that it's exactly this type of values that are uh, produced by commons are not are not considered because there are not ways of of making them visible and calculating them, um, uh, and and this was key because um, we had the, a, a typical problem with urban commerce um, following the change of municipality. In you know, urban commons are haunted by new enclosures. Yeah, and. Uh, uh, and in our case, uh, there was uh, there were local elections in 2014, and um, there was a new mayor that has asked for um, you know a right wing mayor that has asked for the replacement of uh, um, Agrosite with with a temporary private car park. And this uh, incident, of course, confirmed the the fact that uh, uh, you know. Uh, uh, commons uh, are a political project today because uh, they are questioning and subverting the capitalist order and uh, uh, so this local decision has to, uh, has triggered a, a wave of solidarity amongst professionals and researchers and local uh, residents and massimo <laughs> i don't know if he's still on but uh, uh, he might remember this moment because he was present uh, so this uh, this was a new stage within the commoning process and uh, unfortunately, we have lost uh, in court, um, and we had to um, um, to accept that the agro city was demolished uh, in 2017. Um, and uh, and uh, in fact, we have followed this process, um, knowing that. Um, we didn't want to give up. So, in, in absence of uh, protecting laws, and you know, this is a well-known pro um, problem <laughs> that there are no laws that protect commons. Uh, we have used Aikido to defend it. So, we have moved around the punch and took control of the situation by um, instigating um, an intelligent demolition. I mean, the building was designed for this and uh, finding a new location negotiating it it was a parking 
and then uh, using uh, the stakeholders now as the advocates of the project. And there, there were those that, um, you know, um, contributed to uh, its reinstallment. And I think the fact of seeing it rebuilt was, was a very, very strong moment. Uh, because they show that there are ways around, yeah, that, that, that um, you know, we can still fight a capitalist mayor uh, in a different way. Um, and uh, and it's, it's even more than uh, there were other municipalities because the protest campaign was very visible and there were others finding out about the project. So they wanted also AgroCite. So we have opened a new AgroCite in, uh, in July 2019 um, in Bagneux. Uh, another suburban city, um, we are doing uh, another uh, hub there. So there will be a new network uh, emerging there. Um, we have also uh, won um, a competition uh, for uh, a bigger, um, let's say, hub, uh, which is more like a node now, a regional node in the process, and uh, also there are other uh, municipalities interested in. So, uh, and there is an urban franchise in London. So instead of disappearing, uh, this has been multiplied. And I think uh, the message here is that uh, we want it to grow and to become a movement. I mean, we have discussed before about social movements. I think this would be a, a slightly different type of movement. And we hope, um, you know, uh, other initiatives will be federated. And uh, it is like this that we can, uh, as architects, I think, uh, design support, but also defend commons uh, 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 to, to be more sustainable. Thank you. I've seen the, the zero <laughs> note. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much for this. And now I will hand it on to Laura. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, let me check uh, if uh, here. All right, so can you see it? Yes, we can see it. Yep. Okay. So do, do you see the screen, right? Yes. Perfect. So uh, thank you, uh, of course, for this wonderful uh, invitation. Uh, in such a deep and vivid discussion as the one that we pushed forward in this first day, I would now just limit myself uh, to add perhaps a final layer of reflection on the commons, particularly on the digital commons, uh, by extending such debate to mapping, uh, not just either the existing or new methodologies uh, to uh, uh, map the commons that we might increasingly experience within the digital turn, but trying also implicitly to um, reflect on the kind of potentialities, but even, uh, let's say, unintended consequences of making the map and it's uh, both the navigational and communicative nature, the space for a common ground, a shared side for a collective intervention, uh, more so in the context of migration struggles, which are referred to today, uh, that are crucially invigorated uh, in the last uh, years. So uh, contemporary mapping projects actually brought out several ideas on what uh, commoning might mean and how many commoning actually hacks can be acknowledged through mapping at every step of its life uh, cycle. Uh, we might not only refer indeed to the many flourishing cartographies of the commons or the common goods and common services, but also uh, refer to the kind of common and cross source of the production of the map that often happens uh, uh, today, or also refer to the open circulation of maps and the information they bring, or even to the free use of database and continuous appropriation of its content, but of course trying also to consider the kind of impact then the hand that these mappings have uh, um, concerning uh, basically the commons. So asking whether mappings are always effective navigational and communicative tools uh, for the commoning of um, migration. Uh, so overall, I will say that within uh, the cartographic realm, 
the line between a special information technology as a potentially liberating and gathering force and uh, a technology that actually serves to reproduce existing power relations uh, can be often uh, very unclear. Uh, but as uh, Nancy Peluso uh, in her uh, famous article on counter mapping noticed, given the alternative futures of not being on the map as you were uh, being obscured from view and every local claims obscured, there almost seems to be no choice uh, uh, at all. Uh, so I would say that in this respect, uh, many hacktivists and radicals uh, actually uh, starting to appropriate the maps which they perceived as master's tools against master's tools themselves. Um, so using them as a kind of toolbox for their struggles, be here to protect indigenous uh, territories, uh, to visualize special injustice, uh, to organize the resistance and protest, and also various forms of solidarity. In my work, I would say that I became uh, particularly interested in the kind of uh, combat or a clash between various uh, forms of digital and even non-digital mapping, governmental, artistic, uh, uh, activist, um, concerning uh, mostly the Southern European migration, the Mediterranean uh, migration, highlighting both the role of maps as a kind of border control devices, as kind of immobilizing force, but also as uh, you know, archives of the present moment, solicitors of protest, or even as infrastructures of uh, uh, solidarity. Of course, today the deluge of questions provided by the conveners uh, adds more food uh, for thought. So offering another set of complementary questions that we might reflect on. So first, can actually the individuals, the uh, networks and organizations involved in the uh, migration journeys and in migration struggles be considered uh, to raise new forms of commons. And are maps in the sense effective, as I say before, navigational and communication device uh, for the commoning of migration? And if so, which specific actions, so let's say maps and gender, they might be functional for the commoning of migration, but also which kind of space and subjectivities are CMO, uh, enacted and, and connected through maps within the migratory uh, sphere. So first of all, I, do wanna, uh, I don't want to strictly refer here to an economic sense of the common, but I want to really very briefly try to interrogate more speculatively uh, an heterogeneous idea of the community uh, from uh, the perspective uh, foregrounded by uh, Roberto Esposito in, in his philosophical work as something where we actually uh, renounce uh, to our subjectivity and allow for the constructions of new forms of agency. But before explicitly refer uh, to a uh, exposito understanding of the community, I want uh, here just you to notice that uh, the term of community comes of course from the classic Latin word the communitas, which is a compound word. So the cum, of course, is a prefix indicating a sharing, but then we have the monus that translates actually to mean uh, very different things, a service, a burden, a duty, an obligation, a gift, an artifact, a funeral offer, and a public spectacle. So, of course, drawing such uh, different meanings of the munus, also many ideas of the commons uh, may, can be taken into account. In particular, Esposito underlines this idea that the munus that the communitas shares is not a property or a possession, is not a having, but on the contrary, is a debt is a pledge, is a gift that is to be given, and that therefore will establish a lock. So the subjects of community are, are united by an obligation in the sense that we say, I owe you something, but without expecting uh, something back. So actually, mm, in the, the, the words and, and the thought of Esposito, community is not considered as a plenitude. It's not a membership, it's not even a property, of course, but it's a kind of exposure of the self uh, to the other, is a community of risk, not just, let's say, a warm um, blanket. So considering this idea of the community, 
as a kind of uh, shared but not reciprocal uh, obligation where we, we, the self is exposed to the other, to the outside, I would say the mapping uh, migrant commons will first impose as the operation of mapping outside ourself, outside our primary interest. But this, uh, this is of course this we that we need to question a little bit more uh, specifically, who is in fact the we of the migrant commons. Because within migration struggles, we have uh, to take into account, of course, the subjectivity and the actions of migrants themselves and how they get organized among them but also then activists, social organizations, even ordinary citizens, of course, they can offer uh, support to them, empowerment, without, of course, leaving the same condition. So here the sense of whose commons, for whom, of course, in constructs an intricate web of relations where interest may be different, of course, can be aligned, but although power asymmetries uh, shape such relations in very different ways. <clears throat> so such a diversity, I would say that also clearly emerge in the cartographic contest where actually maps and mapping engage differently and different actors in the role of producers, uh, consumers, and users, let's say, but also in both role, uh, the consumers. Uh, in this sense. And uh, so to let, let's say, these different uh, subjectivities and the space where they operate emerge, I want uh, really just to give us some example uh, that might um, address my idea, of course, uh, of the role of mapping as digital commons and the kind of infrastructure of uh, solidarity. So first of all, I would say that uh, within the framework of undocumented migration of forced mobility, uh, maps may be start to be seen as a kind of a mobile commons. The term mobile commons actually was coined and developed uh, by Papadopoulos and Sianos in 2013. Um, and, uh, to imply, let's say, the kind of mundane, vernacular, uh, uh, organizational practices of people on the move. That is, the sharing knowledge, the effective uh, uh, cooperation, the support and care uh, between migrants when they actually are on the move. So it is a uh, sharing knowledge, which refers, of course, to border crossings, to routes to take, to shelters where to go, to hubs, uh, to escape routes, uh, to resting place. But this knowledge is also digitally driven. Uh, Dana de Minescu, for instance, talked about the dimension of the connected migrant to align this possibility of migrants to construct virtual space of encounter, contact, and organization where actually physical can be missed depending indeed on who grants, of course, access to Wi-Fi and smartphones, the digital may activate such fluid territories uh, online that contrast the, the physical and often very perpetual immobility experienced by migrants on the ground. For instance, when they're stuck in detention centers, in camps, but also in boats. In this context, actually, the maps uh, became a kind of connectors, a kind of actionable objects that allow to get organized and act uh, together. But here, of course, we can also distinguish between the perspective of migrants and the one of activists and social organization. Of course, let's say that from the perspective of migrants, uh, mobile navigational tools integrated into smartphones, such as Google Maps, have become some of the most, uh, let's say, uh, important uh, reliable companions because the institutional information about safe routes is also very difficult to find. The non-institutional information provided through smugglers and traffickers is likely deceptive or false. So in such situation, migrants really usually rely exclusively on the routes marked by Google Maps on our other apps and maps designed by other migrants or, and of course also social activists. And they can share them and they can share they, even their home coordinates through WhatsApp up, for instance. We, we, we will see this feature um, after. But even from the perspective of, uh, of activists and social movements, the role of maps as mobile commons is quite, is quite interesting. 
for instance, uh, uh, many of us in Europe uh, um, are still impressed by the, the spectacular passage, actually, of migrants from Budapest in Hungary to the Austrian border on September 2015, the so-called also long summer of migration, which took at least really for a moment the characteristic of a political movement. And for instance, uh, um, since many uh, of these people were still uh, stuck in many camps, temporary camps that created the in the heart of the European Union, actually on September uh, the 6th, 2015, an activist organization uh, from uh, Vienna tweeted the exact location of a temporary refugee camp in Roski, uh, a little town there on the Serbian border. So that drawing, driving from Austria, many volunteers actually used the, the GPS coordinates uh, to reach the camp and it help actually the migrants escape. So this combination of the social network with the mapping with this locative um, application enacted really the organization of the voluntary movement where the map became a kind of a cum munus in the latin sense of the word a shared uh, service a shared product a shared obligation but also revealed and let's say this event uh, how migrants themselves are perceived as a kind of common in the sense of, like a, a subject of common interest uh, for these people so this mobilizing characteristic of the navigational mapping is also one that allowed uh, activists and social organization to establish actually uh, several uh, platforms that aim at combining rescue operations of migrants at sea, especially in the Mediterranean Sea, of course with the building of bridge and with migrant and social struggles on land. It is important here to remind that, of course, uh, people risk every day their life by crossing the sea in the attempt uh, to reach Europe. The problem is that, of course, European Union state members have literally decelerated the search and rescue activities at sea, not only now with the coronavirus, but already by the hand of 2014. So actually what's happening is that many NGOs, uh, social organizations, social movements are filling this void by sharing legal knowledge, transport means, uh, mapping and tracking tools to comply the shared obligation the European agencies refuse to attend, that is that of saving people in danger. Hallam Forum, for instance, is an activist outline the track these SOS calls uh, sent my, by migrants or their relatives in situation of distress. Because what uh, frequently happens is that migrants, when they have to embark on a journey, try to share their GPS location to WhatsApp to their relatives in order that, that they can track them and call the rescue agencies at a certain um, point. Uh, so um, in the sense, I would say that through the platform, these activists have to mediate between migrants who attempt to reach them by phone and national and international rescue actors who may not detect the distress calls or chose to ignore them. So here the possibility of reconnecting these bodies of waters with the land is actualized through this range of vocal and sonic experiences of tracking these unseaworthy boats. But the function of Alarm Form is not only that of connecting than distinct actors for the rescue of migrants, but also to uh, denounce, let's say, the breach of legal obligation of states related to search and rescue. So here, an additional feature of the map that should be considered is also that of, of exposing, of course, of making uh, invisible injustice. So this means actually that cross-sourced um, database, cross-sourced maps uh, are not only uh, produced uh, to uh, support, let's say, nearly real-time uh, migrant crossings and rescue, but maps are also conceived as a communicational tool. They are evocative media. They may collect data about uh, um, location of fatalities at sea, abuses, uh, and crimes. So in this sense, also uh, migrants, um, the cartography of migrant commons, uh, sorry, became also uh, a kind of forensic 
commons. So the map users here assume the role of investigators and maps are consequently designed as a kind of evidence for migration advocacy, constructing a new collective space for intervention where the abuses and the necropolitics, these politics of letting die people at sea are now exposed. So we might say that among maps that are used to materially move uh, people uh, through their navigational property, so the maps as mobile commons, but also to move both discussions and legal evidences through their mediatic apparatus, there is also a third specific function of mapping as a common here, which is that of the memorialization. Uh, in fact, even the experience, let's say, of gathering around a map may construct a performance of the common. Because as I said in the introduction, in Latin, the munus of the communitas also means a funeral offer and a public spectacle. For instance, to commemorate the tragic migrants shipwreck occurred on April 19, 2015, a large map of the Mediterranean Sea was rolled over a square in Marseille. Flowers were left on, on the surface to reproduce the setting of a funeral. So many people assembled around the map and denounced the European policies against migration, inspired by what Maurice Stirl has defined a kind of grief activism, which is precisely this kind of feelings of empathy and mourning to what people we never met, the gather people and motivate them to denounce the European migration policies. So a kind of denouncing through remembering. So to conclude, I will say there will, there will be many other examples to provide, but it will suffice to say that once the etymology of the community is fully considered, many unorthodox ways uh, to think about commons and commoning within the cartographic migration culture emerge. Through the lens of migrant mobility also, new forms of commons flourish in alternative space, um, as the ones usually covered, let's say, by the, the, the activist criticism. So not only the city, but also the sea, of course, the refugee camp, the detention center. And the one of migration is also a contest where mapping in both digital and non-digital forms emerged as a cum, a cum munus, let's say, a shared obligation, a shared donation, a shared service, a funeral offer, and a gathering a spectacle. Um, I would say that, of course, the subjects involved in this mapping activities remi remain quite heterogeneous, uh, from migrants to activists to ordinary citizens. But in general, transversal ideas of solidarities enable us to imagine this commonality in differences, processes in which subjects are placed in our, even placed in hierarchies, of course, uh, align directions accordingly in the sense of common concerns. And the community imagine, I will say, by Sposito might be one of those in leaning forward to the side, in mapping outside ourselves, the migrant commons emerge, I would say, as a shared, but not forcibly, uh, let's say, reciprocal uh, obligation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, all of you. It's been really fascinating to hear, you know, the ways in which participatory architecture, uh, mapping practices, hashtags and protests in the streets are all creative and important tools to sort of remobilize and reimagine the commons and commoning practices. Um, so, I, yeah, I thank, I thank you for these insights. And just to sort of start the discussion going, but I really hope we can engage with one another because I think there's so much to draw upon from each other. Um, I'm wondering, uh, firstly, uh, Tali and Zizi, you know, you've provided uh, a lot of insight uh, into the, the type of designs, spaces, publics and affects that are formed during temporary moments of social unrest. And I was wondering, perhaps, you know, to invite you to engage with one another, is there more to say about the, the way in which physical and mediated spaces interact to enable these type of politics? Uh, but even more so, um, in what ways can these new sort of narratives and imaginations or, or temporary spaces that they create uh, can, in fact, enact systematic change? I know it's a difficult question, but I'm wondering if you have any insight into that. 
Um, you know, I would say that, um, let me just start and, <laughs> um, and just quickly make a comment that um, for me, it's always been difficult to uh, distinguish between the physical and the mediated. And the recent COVID-19 crisis has made it even more so because it's, it's very difficult to me to imagine any aspect of our physical presence that's not mediated in some way and vice versa. If we understand media in, you know, beyond the literal, but, we, but in a more, in a broader sense, um, I think we'll come to realize that the inadequacy of our vocabulary or at the very least our English uh, vocabulary for des describing these relations. I think um, I have difficulty distinguishing between physical and mediated spaces when, when it comes to talking about commons. And even when I use the terminology hybrid, um, I feel uncomfortable because I'm not really sure what we are um, hy hybridizing, you know, constantly, for instance, in recent riot, riots in my hometown of Chicago, I saw people use, um, not just flip back and forth between mobile and physical interfaces, but just really use them in tandem in a continuum. So move through the cartography or the streets of the city, uh, as Laura would say, uh, at, and at the same time consult uh, drop points on Reddit or on WhatsApp to see how the protest um, was uh, was moving, was evolving in a way that was not as not too dissimilar from again the way that you described Laura. So I'm I'm not sure how to answer that question. I mean, what I have to say is that I I never really saw a point in drawing that distinction, and I I guess I see even less of a point in doing so now. Well, I, I do agree with uh, Zizi about the fact that separating uh, the virtual from the physical or the mediated from the actual presence of actions is very superficial nowadays. And I think that what I was trying also, maybe not successfully to, to push forward is that we need to find new categories to look at the commons and to look at public spaces. And for me, uh, again, one of the most um, important categories that comes, and even before uh, the pandemic, is the, the, the concept of distance. Because distance uh, has, again, multi-layer uh, meanings. And I think that if we will try to address this, we will be able to better understand also the commons. Uh, but I, I agree with Zizi. I think that some of the some of the categories that we try to understand and even convey some of the, the issues and the questions that you have raised are a little bit limited uh, in the way we can understand what's happening now on the ground. But do, do you want to say more about that? Because yeah, it sounds really interesting. Well, um, I think that uh, one of the interesting um, things, again, that I was trying to raise is the, the question of uh, imagination uh, and how imagination uh, also helps us to uh, conceptualize differently spaces and categories. And I think this is the main tool that we have today. But um, I mean, I can give here a whole lecture about these binaries and how we need to, to push forward, but maybe we will let others also to respond to it. But I think definitely a new language needs to be developed. And I think one of the things that I'm happy uh, in participating in this panel is actually meeting Zizi, because I think that uh, part of this uh, evolution of new categories cannot be disciplinary. And although I'm an architect and planner, and I focus mainly on uh, analyzing uh, protests and how they're being designed and formed from a very spatial uh, architectural and planning perspective, I think that I, I can see a lot of commonalities also in the way we talk and think uh, with people from uh, the media or political science and so forth. And I think disciplinary boundaries, uh, categories, uh, boundaries between uh, different things also needs to be challenged. I think scale also is one of the issues that have been raised in different ways because um, 
the scale of mapping, the scale of the events, the scale of the commons. So there are lots of categories that might be helpful to questions from this kind of multidisciplinary approach. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, and I think this is why it's so exciting to, uh, to kind of have all of us together. Um, and I think uh, Doina and Laura, it's, it's been really interesting to hear you kind of dive sort of deeply into these modes of um, the ways in which communities appropriate space uh, or the kind of methods of mapping and understanding and visualizing space, uh, communities that form on the move or communities that form through the closest of kind of living in the same neighborhood. Um, and I think um, there's a lot to say about issues of marginalization to begin with, with the, this concept of the commons and also thinking about the history of this terminology or these kind of uh, current modes that we see of people trying to speak for the people, but also in terms of within these communities, the sort of micro politics that are formed around them. Um, and I was wondering if you could say more about these type of dynamics and how we can build senses of community and commonality whilst taking into account these historical and current and um, issues of marginalization and power dynamics that are taken that need to be taken into a part in order to do what you Laura kind of suggest like re rethinking of this this concept altogether so who wants to answer first go. Doina you want to go no yes go ahead okay yeah. um, no of course it's a very complex uh, question so I don't have an answer I can also see what's happening um, to, to try to answer. I would say that, for instance, uh, the idea of a community uh, that is foregrounded by Sposito highlights the, the fact that there are power dynamics, uh, and, but also trying to understand that without these power dynamics, we cannot really uh, develop a political sense of the, of the common. So before we talked in the, the, the first panel about like the bottom up per perspective, but then we do not question the bottom and the up of this perspective. There are many layers of the bottom, many layers in the up. Uh, they, of course, can align within each other and construct a new networks, even very temporary. So singularities, they really match uh, for a moment to create something and then they can also uh, disperse in the sense. In the, in the case, of course, uh, uh, migrant mapping, if we call uh, about that, this. Migrants, of course, usually are not the producers of maps. Uh, they are the one who use maps uh, to do something, let's say. So here there is also privilege. Uh, so mapping is still, let's say, a privileged tool, uh, mostly used by hectares of global north. So there is a lot to do with that. I would say that in migration struggles, often the migrants becomes the figure of the informant of the cultural mediator that can help activists, of course, in refugee camps or in other uh, situations. So we have to see um, something new uh, in, uh, in this, uh, let's say. Uh, I don't know if Doina want to... Um, well, um, in, in our case, I think, um... It was very important to rethink the role of um, of, of the architect, so to say, as uh, as moving, as and as taking uh, different position within the power structure. And uh, we were uh, uh, on the top uh, in the beginning because we were initiators and uh, we were uh, somehow um, uh, coordinator of this consortium that have. Uh, obtain that has obtained um, funding to start the implementation of uh, of the first hubs, but also um, we uh, we then uh, shifted to a different role uh, during the process in which uh, we were more facilitators. Uh, we were uh, also, I mean, we are stepping out uh, little by little, and then we we take uh, a, a more marginal role. Uh, being uh, advisor, uh, you know, uh, sometimes uh, stepping in and stepping out also. And I think uh, um, thinking about power, uh, you know, uh, as, as, as dynamic uh, is, is very, very important. But also th thinking about uh, this shift in roles that 
we were, uh, let's say, uh, giving an example of, but also other people in the community um, were able to become leaders of a group or, uh, or to, to sort of uh, emancipate them, themselves from a marginal position to a more, uh, more important position. And, and I, I think uh, we did this with, uh, with conscious and care uh, and, and, and this took time. And I think that the time question is, is very important um, because um, it is, um, you know, the, these are complex uh, processes and uh, it's not enough to, um, you know, um, to, to research on them. You know, sometimes you have to do action research and you have to, um, um, you, you know, for example, in my research, it was always a, a sort of inferential process. So I, I did more research after, uh, you know, the practices arrived at a certain uh, um, outcome and then, uh, uh, and then so on, and and, uh, uh, and and this is also a way of building trust, um, not only between us and others, but also between the whole uh, community that that sees that it is perceived as an important um, kind of um, thing. <laughs> uh, the other thing is the scaling up and the and and this idea of a network, which also de decentralized power, so a local project that has the tendency, I mean, there are lots of conflicts in a project, but also it has the tendency to close itself, you know, which is somehow one of the definition of the commons, yeah, that it has to, uh, to kind of close around the community and put the boundary um, around the pool of resources. Um, the fact of uh, disenclaving it and uh, opening it up to a network of similar projects uh, and to keep it also on the move, I think uh, at the end, this kind of negative incident uh, became also a positive uh, opportunity to show that yes, we can be mobile, but we are not losing our resources <laughs> somehow. So we are continuing in a different way. We are uh, reframing uh, the community around it in such a way that there is continuity and, and somehow, uh, I think that I would also answer a little bit your first question, which was about how temporary places can enact uh, sy systemic change. Um, uh, I think it was addressed to <laughs> uh, to Zizi and um, uh, and, and yeah. Tali. Um, I, well, in our case, it was also <laughs> uh, mm -hmm. a case of temporary places that. Uh, um, by creating connections and I think uh, uh, making sense in time of, uh, of the different disparate, um, you know, local undertakings, uh, uh, successes and failures uh, and building up on this um, is a way of, um, I think, uh, creating change uh, that uh, has the chance to become more systemic. Can I... Can I add something? Yes, please do. This is exactly what we try to create. <laughs> a well, conversation. I, I, I was listening. I was listening to the previous panel, and I think that uh, what characterized the previous panel is that they were very structuralist about their approach to commons. Uh, really much placed in the political science. Um, and the system and the role of the system in creating, defining, or uh, demolishing uh, the commons. And I think this panel is, is very different in the way each one of us has presented a very specific uh, dimension regarding uh, the commons. But at the same time, I'm not sure all of us really believe that the commons exist because if, uh, if I look at, uh, uh, if I think about the presentation of Zizi and myself, I think that what we emphasize is actually the skepticism regarding the commons and actually their uh, existence, where I think that uh, Doina and also Laura uh, are more kind of uh, trying to, to map or even to construct or build this vision of the commons. And I think this is a very interesting um, perspective regarding the commons. Again, I think that also in the previous uh, session, there was no uh, reflexivity whether or not the commons actually exist nowadays. Mm -hmm. 
and I think this is a very important question. And I, I, I bring this up because of uh, the, the dimension of temporality, because if you ask me, I think the commons exist uh, in temporal uh, moments. We can identify moments of the commons. And I don't think that we can actually say that the commons are something that um, exists all the time or we can find it everywhere. And I think this is one of the issues that we, we, have to, we have to question whether or not we actually want to push to this kind of static uh, category of the common or the static idea of the common. I'm not sure it is achievable, but I, I, I don't think it was existed ever. And I think that we also need to maybe think or discuss this. So I, I'd like to add something to that because I think very much along the same lines and I find this whole line of thinking fascinating. I mean, I would agree. I, 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 um, I would say yes, uh, not necessarily that, you know, the commons don't exist, but I don't think that what we understand as, as the commons exist. I think we just have some sort of imagined shared preconception of this sort of perfect public space together all of our commonalities and our potential commonalities um, and that could be you know part online and offline and what have you but I don't think we've ever really had uh, and sort of could be could exist you know away from um, interest you know privatized interest interests of all of all of all types um, uh, and all kinds of motivations and I don't I don't really think we've ever had such a space. I think all of the spaces where we've discussed um, what we care about have always been hybrid, you know, starting from the Greek Agora, which was both a space of conversation and a space of co commerce. This is very much what we have nowadays. Two other spaces where we discussed political affairs together with social matters. And that's something that seems to irk people so much about Facebook or Instagram or other places that we don't have any kind of political conversation that's purely political. Well, we've never done that as human beings. It's deeply unnatural. We never sort of, you know, we don't have a switch that we say, okay, now I'm gonna turn the switch on and I'm going to talk merely about political matters. And then I'm gonna turn this switch off and I'll talk about social matters. We kind of blend um, all of those in our heads. And I think this is part of the reason why many of us feel more comfortable using terms like imaginaries and things like that, because you know the commons, the public sphere, the private sphere, these are all things that, these are valuable metaphors. These are, you know, this is valuable vocabulary in describing what we would like to have, what we would like to aspire to, uh, what we would like to work towards perhaps. And then in the process of working towards it, what we adjust it and we modify it and we make it something that's much more inclusive and, uh, and diverse. But I think perhaps it's more meaningful to understand the commons as a, you know, it's just like a reflexive abstract notion that's constantly in flux rather than a, a this sort of static ideal that we must look for in every different era. And if we don't find it in a given era, oh my God, what a disaster, you know, <laughs> what has become of us? Mm -hmm. So perhaps there's a need to talk more about the idea of commoning rather than the commons, um, which I think, uh, Darna, you've written a lot about um, and I would love to hear if you have any thoughts about that. Um, well, uh, I'll, I'll just um, take further on, on, on the uh, previous uh, line and, and say that uh, uh, I, I, I would say the opposite. I won't discuss about commons in abstract, but I will always situate uh, discussion because I think uh, in in you know when you speak about commons in a historical uh, perspective uh, you know there is a whole history of commons you 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 can very clearly uh, relate something that happens today to the history uh, and I think that the the notion it's um, it's probably too broad uh, and uh, used too abstractly. Uh, so it can go in all directions and maybe not make sense anymore. But if you are situating it, um, you know, uh, both in a geography, in a history, in a, in a kind of social practice, uh, then it makes sense and it makes a lot of sense. And I would say that it's, it's, it's important to, uh, um, well, 
to engage with it uh, uh, because, as I say, there is. I try to say it, it is a political project. So it's it's not. Um, it's it's probably uh, it's not uh, the new Marxism. Uh, it's not. Uh, um, maybe it's difficult to place it in in the in the kind of political history um, uh, as as we uh, as as we have inherited now but um, um, it is um, uh, probably a new form of politics which is more uh, uh, more participative and more more, um, more needed uh, today so uh, coming back to to commoning uh, I would say the same. Uh, you know, it can take um, many forms, and 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 it 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 it, uh, it suppose. I mean, at least I would speak about my experience of common <laughs> and commoning uh, from um, sharing knowledge to to sharing um, um, you know physical um, to sharing space to sharing uh, um, uh, physical assets to sharing. Um, uh, and taking responsibility together, I think uh, uh, producing and reproducing together. Um, this aspect is very important and that's why I have uh, insisted also on uh, commoning related to governance. Um, again, a term that uh, is very complex and complicated, but um, I, I would put it more in terms of uh, responsibility. <laughs> Uh, taking responsibility and um, um, and, um, and 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 taking care also. Um, so um, I jump into the discussion and just pass on a question from the Zoom chat because I think it's it relates to what you were saying. Uh, this question is addressed specifically to Doina and it says. Thank you for a really fascinating presentation and for your great work. Please, could you say more about if there are any traces or reminders remaining in the first space that is now sadly a parking lot that it was previously used for our urban. And if I can build on that and maybe touch upon what Zizi was saying about the, the momentary and the ephemeral commoning practices and ask if, we as architects, Doina, Tali, but in a more general sense also, what can we do to create the urban conditions and create those entry points for communities and local stakeholders to participate and engage in these collective urban practices and experiments? And also what is the, the role of pedagogy in training residents, people, communities to see the benefits of these projects and maybe render them render them more resilient and more sustainable. This is a tough question. <laughs> I don't know, Tali, you want to go no, go ahead. Yeah. Well, <laughs> relating to the question about uh, what is left. Uh, uh, in the first space, um, I mean, this this was a very specific question to me. Um, I think what is left is is the uh, we have opened up the Im imagination of, uh, of of this of this neighborhood. Uh, part of uh, the former users are are still continuing to um, attend the new um, um, the relocated uh, hub, uh, which is not far from the, the initial location, but also um, I think it has become a point of reference for um, now there are new local elections, for example. So uh, it is still a point of reference for, for the, um, uh, let's say election discussion and, and, and potentially for, uh, for the political future of, uh, of the city and of the neighborhood. So I think all, uh, all this, uh, you know, um, uh, and it was very, very important for us that there is not a negative story that remains, that there, there was the reinstallment and the fact that uh, despite, uh, you know, the, the fact that we have uh, lost in court because the, we, there are no protective laws, um, uh, there is a continuation and, and this is possible 
and there is a let's say positive out, out, outcome of uh, all all this um, uh, commoning process so this is what has been left yeah uh, i would say a powerful story and and an opening up of the imaginary and coming back to the role of pedagogy yes i think it's very very important because, because and it's not only <clears throat> pedagogy from our side i think we are learning together you know it's it um, it is because I have uh, lived um, this experience, I, I, I can um, testimony on it. Um, the, the fact that uh, you are learning from the others that are not, uh, that are more experts than you in certain things, uh, you are also passing on your knowledge. Uh, we have also brought students that have learned, but also have, uh, have passed on their knowledge uh, so, so it's a very rich, um, uh, I think, um, again, we created a very rich um, context in which um, um, we have all learned, it, it was not easy, but we have all learned how, how to do things together. Let me just add uh, two points. I mean, I think that uh, almost in every book that I write or paper that I finish, I'm emphasizing at the end the role of uh, the, the role of uh, planners and architects. I think they are key and important agents in uh, reforming thinking about the commons. Uh, unfortunately, I don't think they are engaged enough. I mean, I think that most of the literature and most of the provocative thinking does not come from architecture and planning. Um, so, but at the same time, I would say architects and planners are definitely responsible for some of the, the creation of these spaces. Secondly, they are great reader of these spaces. You know, in the past, um, I'm familiar with some very uh, prominent architects that have already, that have planned protests uh, for uh, different uh, movements, we rarely see this kind of involvement nowadays. I think unfortunately architects and planners have kind of uh, diminished their role to a much more pragmatic capitalist um, you know, um, project. And I, I think this is something that has to be put forward and be sought uh, and be pushed and discussed all the time. I think that uh, the politics should not be part only or discussed only in uh, the disciplines of political science. It does happen, but it's still in the margin. I don't think that we see like, for example, uh, movements of architects pushing forward with new ideas for the commons, with new ideas for the public spaces. We don't see it. Uh, it's, uh, it's a very kind of um, subtle nowadays profession that is much more engaged in analyzing case studies instead of, you know, bringing something new to the... Well, I, I disagree. The I, I think they, they are. I, I think maybe they are not as visible or maybe they are not visible there where you are looking for, but um, there are, I, I mean, there are schools also that are teaching this, uh, th there are uh, publications about this, you know, the, uh, a recent publication was at the Atlas of Commons where there are lots talking of- about, I'm talking about actual movements, social movements that engage architects and planners. I'm not just talking about projects that, uh, and I think that there are some things that happening, but it's still in the margins. I don't think they have voice yet, sorry. Well, this has to be reclaimed. <laughs> The voice, I think, but I, I'm I'm more optimistic about, you know, there is a future generation that will be much more probably visible and um, kind of uh, active than other generations. <laughs> um, I wonder if if I may um just uh, join in very quickly. I I just have a couple of very quick questions um before we wrap up. I know we're running over time um. Lara, I had a, um, a question for you, and I'm sure you've thought about this a lot already. I've really enjoyed um, how you unpack mapping um, as almost community making as, as, as opposed to the, the traditional sort of narratives you usually hear of mapping 
um, in in your words, not just privileging some, you know, some people are allowed to uh, map, but as a um, as a form of domination, colonializing um, acts. Um, and I was wondering, you know, is the um, is the digital space and technology enabling more marginal mappers to step into the space, or do you? Think, and this might be a little out there and, and maybe more Talia's, um, Talia's um, perspective, but uh, as we enter cyberspace, that it is another space that is being colonialized and dominated, or are these opportunities for, for community building um, from, from marginal voices? Well, that's wonderful questions. Um, well, I will say that, of course, in the digital space, we find uh, I, I wouldn't say democratic ways, as Zizi said in her introduction, but plural ways of mapping, uh, simply because, of course, uh, it's full of open source software where amateur and vernacular mappers can do, of course, uh, they, their maps. And by doing these maps, they also establish new communities of, uh, of mappers. And of course, as you said, uh, if the digital space is the same in the end of the physical space, there are power relations even, even theirs. If you don't have a specific skills, if you don't have uh, your laptop, uh, you, if you don't know how to access the software, of course, you will not have access to this kind of knowledge. But I would say they compared it to the past, of course. It's much more evident um, in the sense. Uh, I was also thinking that, uh, for instance, there were platforms and software like uh, Ushahidi, uh, which uh, means really that the, the testimony, uh, the witness uh, that really um, were born uh, thanks to the digital and today, you know, they, they come together, they do the kind of hackathon uh, to help uh, in mapping when there are, uh, you know, uh, kind of uh, conflict events, dangerous events and, and so forth. But it's, it's of course, it's, it's a space where you cannot be totally positive, of course. Uh, you can be both techno-pessimist pessimist and techno-optimist at the same time, uh, let's say, especially, especially regarding mapping. In the end, I would just say that, of course, if you want to communicate to a large audience, uh, the map must resemble a bit the one of the powerful force. Because if you want to communicate with them, you have to use, let's say, fire with fire. So if uh, I, I'm saying things, I'm saying things especially um, related to uh, you know, lots of databases and maps that have been made uh, uh, really to locate the deaths at sea. So they, 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 they use the same software, let's say, in the same logic of colonialist mapping and so forth. But I, I always thought that if they don't choose this kind of a language, the power could remain deaf to their claims. You know, in this sense, it's really a counter mapping and do, you have to find the same tools. It's something like a preparatory, I would say. And then in the, in the clash, in the kind of fight that you engage, you can develop, of course, also new language, new forms and new symbol. symbol. Yeah. Right. Very interesting. Thank you. And a final, very quick um, um, one um, for Zizi. Um, uh, I, I particularly enjoyed your um, your effective um, framing, um, it, very performative um, in many ways, but not using emotion, but affections. And it reminds me of um, the involuntary act of laughter that we sometimes share together um, as being um, sort of very community building or, so, or, or something like that, but very presencing. One just quick um, thought. Um, you claim that it, it, in itself, it's it's only um, a form of liminal power. Um, but if that were true, what is the great firewall and and things like this? What are the fears of the powerful to these digital acts that um, seem to be more threatening um, and uncertain and creating uncertainty? Or do you think they're just merely highlighting the uncertainty that already exists um, in social relations and and in our institutions? Okay. Um, yeah, let me see if I'm understanding what you're asking me. Um, I think uncertainty is always present. It's part of human existence. Um, I think it what it's what leads to insecurity and and then also that leads to how we identify ourselves and we connect. 
um, to each other. But the fact that we nobody has a crystal ball and can predict what's going to happen tomorrow plays a huge part in how we understand and relate to the world surrounding us. So uncertainty is not something that's escapable. Uh, but we can use technologies to not necessarily uh, get around the uncertainty, but tell stories about it, um, tell stories about how we are and where we find ourselves in that uncertainty that makes us make, a, make us feel more comfortable and, and make this whole process um, much more meaningful. Uh, so, and, and make us also understand that that uncertainty is going to be unavoidable and sometimes it's going to be massive and take on the form of some uh, virus that, you know, just fell upon us and we know very little about it. Um, and sometimes it's just going to be the uncertainty of like, you know, going to work, of, of getting up and going to work in the morning and not, <laughs> not knowing what's going to, what your day is going to be like, what's going to happen uh, with you. So it's, it is part of life. And I think, um, technology is something to be used to, to help us reimagine a, war, a way for relating to that, that uncertainty and all the anxiety that it produces, that it produces. I think where we've erred in a, as a society, um, and yes, it does have to do with, you know, capitalist stakes that are made and claims that are made on technologies that we have created technologies that rather than helping uh, that, that anxiety <laughs> subside, they end up um, drawing us into these, you know, effectively enforced rhythms of uncertainty. And that just sort of tends to magnify our insecurity. And we kind of have to build these mechanisms, these strategies, these sort of antibodies for all these burgeoning forms of um, uncertainty, anxiety, toxicity that end up um, uh, being cultivated and sort of coming to life, rendered into being in these spaces, you know, the, the architecture that technology presents for us. And I found particularly meaningful uh, being part of this panel because I've always used architecture as a starting point for how I understand how technology works. I understand technology as architecture, as a space that predisposes, but doesn't necessarily determine um, specific behaviors. Uh, now the party oh. is that, that okay all right <laughs> you're welcome <laughs> sorry yeah I, I I I should wrap it up because we're, we're already 10 minutes over I just um I wish we could go on all afternoon in all honesty and I hope uh I hope we stay engaged beyond this panel in in ways that we can um unpack some of these uh um ideas further I think they're very important um I it just leaves me to um bring an official end to the who's common for whom panel and we'd like very much to thank uh, all the speakers for their contributions uh, and the audience for for staying with us uh, throughout this stimulating discussion um plenty of thoughtful uh, and thought provoking insights uh I just would like to invite all of you to our final session tomorrow uh, entitled reclaiming the cultural commons uh 1 p.m uk time it's at 8 a.m uh, East Coast time where I am and so on. So um, please join us for that. Um, and then I would say, um, everyone, please uh, feel free to unmute yourselves uh, and give all of our panelists um, a big round of applause. Uh, whilst they're doing that, I would say as well that our video is, is posted on the Crash website from early next week, uh, so you can watch it again if you like. Um, and uh, so please, everyone, um, join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.